Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Let's Process That podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Emily Christopher. Hey, and I'm Nick Connor Camp. We are so glad that you have joined us. Today, we are going to dive in to a topic that has reoccurringly been brought to me or just been brought up recently in conversation um, and something that I feel like I've been dealing with my whole life, and that is people pleasing. So to start, um, I think what's really kicked off some of my mindset shift um, even recently, I feel like I've, I've been on a journey, but I feel like even in the last few months, it's taken an even greater turn or I've had greater growth with it. Um, and it's all because of comedian and writer, John Mulaney. Now, Nick, I know you're not up on current Definitely. stuff, especially no. in the comedy world, but uh, John Mulaney is a famous comedian. He's a writer, um, very talented, has a very crazy life story. He's been in and out of addiction. So um, he said a quote, and it's super simple. It is, likability is a prison. And it is such a simple thing. But when I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, likability is a prison. And recently with one of my coworkers and best friends, um, we have really been wrestling through this for her, especially because this is something she's really processing and growing from, um, is to not be a people pleaser and learning that likability is actually a prison because what happens is people trap you into this idea of who you are. And the minute that you subtly shift from the idea of what they think in their mind, they then hate you. And I have so much experienced this. Oh my gosh. I, I could tell story and story and story about how this has been my experience, how there have been times where people have just absolutely loved me and celebrated me and acted like they were my number one fan. And the minute I had like a slightly differing opinion or I slightly wasn't quote unquote, perfect for them. They dragged me, baby. They dragged me through the mud (laughs) and they didn't want anything else to do with me. And I'm just like, wow, likability is a prison. And I would much rather have people see the, like, see me as I really am. And sometimes that's my fault that I may have tried to be perfect or try to people please them. But sometimes that's their fault because we love to put people up on a pedestal when it is very, very toxic and unhealthy, especially in our culture. So I've kind of set this up. I have a lot more to say about it, but Nick, likability is a prison. Well, I want to respond to what you just said, because most of the times it is our own fault. We're the ones to set those expectations, Mm -hmm. but we do it for a good cause. Our childhood taught us this. Okay, so I do know some people that the kids were the kids were raised to know have an opinion, to have their own preferences, um, and that they could express that to some level. But most of us didn't get that. Most of us were taught what to believe, how to behave, all of that. And sometimes some parents go too far. And not only put their values into their kids, but when their kids don't live up to those values or those behaviors, they withhold love. And so if you know that your parent is going to give you the cold shoulder for a week, I did something one time in high school. I'm not going to tell you. I did something one time in high school. My dad didn't talk to me for a week. He he couldn't talk to me for a full week. Well, as a kid, you don't, you know, you don't understand all those things. All you know is you were taught to believe these things, behave these ways. But when you have a, a, a rogue opinion, an autonomous opinion, you disagree. I remember the day I let the, the um, Jehovah Witnesses in our house. You know, my dad was not happy about that at all. But if, if they pull back their love, if they restrain their approval from you, suddenly you're like, oh, I need to behave and to belong. If, if I 
You know, I, I wish that every kid was instilled with good values, but it, when they became teenagers, they had a chance to express their individuality. But most of us, particularly our ilk, Emily, we grew up with very hard rules about what was right and what was wrong. And if you don't abide by those things, people withhold their, their approval, their blessing, their love. And so we learn to get along. And so it, we come by it honestly, but I do think it's our fault. And it takes a long time to get out of that. Yeah. Well, and um, just being at the place where I have been the last, or I guess three-ish years um, or more, uh, just realizing how debilitating it is to try to make everyone happy, try to make sure that everyone was, you know, I was doing my best for them, you know, not even to the, you know, let's not eat, let's take out God and higher power and like all this stuff, but like for a human approval of who I am. And it really does just drain you. It sucks the life out of you. Um, it takes away from your true self and who you're created to be and you operating in the fullness of who you are. Um, because all you're thinking about is what does this look like to everybody else? And it's exhausting. Yeah. Well, and I'll say this, you know, both of my sons moved several States away so that they could be themselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to be very frank, you did too. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And at oh, yeah, the end of the absolutely. day, at the end of the day, um, you know, I did I did the very best I could as a as a parent, as a father, and at the same time, you know, that my my two sons could not find themselves and be completely autonomous and healthy, interdependent human beings without moving away. I have to take a lot of responsibility mm -hmm. for that. And I came out of that. So it's it's one of those generational things. So if we come from our childhood like that then surely we find our own clan and we're trying to please them to fit in. And then it just sucks the life out of us. And I'm going to say one of the first things that goes is boundaries. We don't have boundaries. Mm -hmm. We're trying to accommodate everybody else, adjust to everybody else. And, you know, there's an old saying that says you cannot lead people if you need people. If you're a leader mm. and you need approval, you can't lead because you'll be adjusting for approval from those that are following you instead of keeping your eye on where the organization needs to go next. And I used to sit there and look at that. And, yeah, I was a people pleaser. Most of my life I've been a people mm. pleaser. So I totally get that, that uh, likability is a prison. Yeah. And, you know, I'm curious, Nick, just with, uh, you know, you've you've had pretty drastic, uh, like career places, like, you know, from the military to ministry to now being an entrepreneur and launching your own thing. Um, what, I mean, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask anyways, which of those did you struggle the most? Cause I know you were in the military at a young age and there's definitely this feeling of wanting to please and do the right thing and, you know, be a good soldier. Um, but then of course there's like ministry stuff where, all eyes are on you. And then there's an entrepreneurial side where it's like, everybody's also watching you and being like, is he going to fail? Is he going to make it? Um, but I'm curious what life experience and um, different environments, what that has affected you? Like, how have you grown and yeah. learned through those different things? Yeah. Well, first of all, the military conformity is just standard procedure. If you know, you, you're a military mm -hmm. family, you know this. It, you have right. to learn to conform. It's just the way it is in the military. It's not personal. It's just the way it is. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I almost wore a different shirt than I wore tonight, but I decided not to because I might have somebody watch that may have pigeonholed me as one side or another side of personality. But I do that for business purposes, mm -hmm. not to be liked. Without a doubt, ministry is by far the hardest to please people 
about what you say, where you go, where you won't go, what you'll talk about, what you won't talk about, how you vote, how you will not vote. It is the whole thing. It is your whole entire life. They judge you, your marriage, your kids, how you vote, how you raise them, how you spend your money, what kind of car you drive. It is like you you cannot drive too nice a car. You cannot drive too poor a car. You have got to drive a car in the middle. And everything about your life is on the calendar. And it's the worst place to be for a people pleaser. Because you you never run out of people that have wants and needs and opinions. And so I was a people pleaser until probably five, seven years ago. It began. I, I had a, some circumstances that broke that. But until then, mm-hmm. I spent my whole life running around trying to please people. Yeah. It's what about you? so exhausting. I got it. Uh, oh, well, I feel like one's pretty obvious, uh, but like, (laughs) um, especially conforming, um, there were so many things that I disagreed with, um, with church stuff in general. And she's talking about me too. We won't dive into, (laughs) yeah, I mean, Nick and I, Nick and I had some very big differences, like, um, but I never felt like I couldn't be myself. I will say, let me pause right there. With you, I always felt safe to disagree with you and okay. that you weren't going to toss me if I disagreed. Okay. Thank but, you. So that was, you were probably like one of my only safe places to be like, hey, this is actually my theological outlook and viewpoint um, in my experience from my studying and my whatever. People are going to probably be like, well, you're saying my too much. Well, we all have a lens, okay? Mm-hmm. Anyways, so I definitely felt like I had to conform to this ideology, especially for a woman. And, um, you know, there was people who celebrated me because I was like outspoken and boisterous and, um, you know, sure of myself. And But there was a lot of people who, oh my gosh, man, that fired them up. Like it would burn them alive to see me, especially when I was getting opportunities to speak or to be on different platforms or whatever. And, um, I, there was one particular time there was people who came to our church and they were just enamored by me. And it, it was like to a point where I was like, this is kind of weird. Um, like, just like, Oh, you are the greatest thing. La 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 la. And I was just like, that's off. Like I'm flattered. Like, thank you. But like, uh, I don't, you know, I I just already automatically knew like, dang, I'm going to, I'm going to screw this up because you are thinking of me like this. And sure enough, like I had to deal with something. Um, in regards to their, some of their behavior on a whole nother subject. And man, when I like held them a little accountable, I suddenly became the devil. I was manipulative. I was, uh, Jezebel. I was like all this stuff. Like it was just the craziest thing. And (sighs) it just is wild how you can, there is literally some kind of trajectory from being like someone's like, they're your number one fan to they're your biggest enemy. Like yeah. they hate you now. And it's such a weird like timeline of events on how that happens. But I see it happen all the time. Like, especially with famous people, like they do one thing, man. And their number one fans are the first people to drag them through the mud and to just like try to destroy everything they've ever done. Um, but it's such a weird place to be in when the tables turn. Like Mm -hmm. it is, you're honestly scared because you're like, dang, I showed you like an ounce of humanity and that you couldn't deal with that. Yeah. So, so did you see Monday night football? Did you see Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift? Did I see Monday night football? Nick Connorkamp, I'm wearing a Barbie sweatshirt. Of course I know everything pop culture going on. So yes, so so they're all like shift. Travis, if you if you guys really are dating, they don't know for sure if they are. But if they are, they're like Travis, they if if you mess up, if you mess up, I'm telling you, all those, gonna, you know, all those swifters are going to kill you. They're going to take you out. And this you better treat her well. You are take and there's a song coming out. She's going to write a song about you. And so it's it's funny because He's a great guy. There's a lot of people love him, 
But if he take if he doesn't take care of Taylor Swift, if there's a problem there, they're going to blame him. <laughs> and they're going to burn him to the ground. For sure. But I mean, that that again is that like weird loyalty thing. Yeah. And if you if any slight opinion is shifted on you, you are now dirt. And it's so scary that we do that to people. What's scarier is the people who do that publicly, like to people they don't know (laughs) or people they don't actually know. Like when people do this stuff with celebrities, I'm like, are you okay? Yeah. They, Taylor Swift doesn't know who you are. Yeah, totally. Travis Kelsey doesn't know who you are. So, so when you write a nasty Facebook uh, post or an Instagram post, like, okay, cool, dude. Like, whatever. But um, yeah, no, that's that's definitely a great example. Like Travis Kelsey, better better watch his back. <laughs> so, so you said something earlier. I'll get us back on track. You said something since I got us off. Okay. Um, Bye. you said something yeah. earlier. Um. I think that most people know whether or not they're a people pleaser, whether or not there are legitimate people I can name in my head right now that don't care what anybody thinks. I don't care what you think. I don't care what I think that they're happy. They don't care. They've got to be the minority. They cannot be the majority. They have got to be the the 10% of the people in this world that have, I don't care attitude. But for the rest of us, Somewhere, either as a kid, teenager, 20s, 30s, 40, 50s, 60, 70, it doesn't matter. Maybe the rest of our lives. We are on that people, people pleasing path. So mm-hmm. I would think that the trigger to getting off of that path is to think of a couple relationships that you have that don't work for you and simply put up mm-hmm. one boundary in each of those relationships mm-hmm. and see, see what happens. If suddenly those people bolt and you can live with it, you're on the way to healing. If those people start to bolt and you can't handle it, then you've got a serious problem with people pleasing. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I think, um, you know, one, coming up with that simple boundary is important. But... Whenever we do lay boundaries down, it shows us where we stand with people. Mm -hmm. And it also shows us what were they getting out of this relationship? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's really painful. Like whenever there is a boundary put down and you learn like, dang, this was not um, this selfless, loving, you know, mutually beneficial relationship. This person was really using me for something. And that could be an emotional gain, a business gain, a work gain, whatever it was. Um, or yeah, or just boosting their own ego. You're some kind of networking connection, whatever. Um, but yeah, watching your own response to that says a lot. And I, I think we just have to prepare ourselves. Like if you really want to work on breaking people, pleasing off, you need to watch how you react to these things and be self-aware enough to pause and step back and be like, all right, let me diagnose this. Why did I just get really upset or really offended or even something, for instance, um, with my work, like there was somebody who walked into the room one day and someone's like, man, as soon as they walked in here, like I like stiffened up, like I was going to get in trouble. And I'm like, okay, your body is even responding. So let's talk. What is it about this person that you feel like you got to be perfect or you have to put on a persona when they come in the room? So there's just little things like that, that especially when your body starts responding, like if there's an outward expression or like your stomach drops or something like that, whenever you mess up in front of this person or whatever, like you need to pause and start asking questions. When you do something that's not typical and the phone rings and it's your parents and you start sweating, okay, there's something there. We need to unpack that. Um, Or your boss walks in the room and like I said, your stomach drops and you get nervous. Your body is saying, hello, something's off. We need to pause and examine what the heck is going on here. Listen, that's great. You gave us some early triggers 
that we may be struggling with being a people pleaser. Uh, my son moved to Florida recently, and he did something that was captured on camera that was a small little thing, but I saw it. And he had never done that in Haywood County. Never. And I thought I need to be very careful right now that I don't pick up the phone and call him, but that I encourage him. You're on the right path. Keep pursuing individuality. What he did was not wrong. It was just unusual for his lifestyle. And so I encouraged him. I wanted to give him permission. So I think what you're saying right now is really important as early triggers. I think one of the later triggers that you may have a serious problem is if you're embarrassed by something you did that's outside your character to please somebody, to conform to a group of people. I mean, you're starting with body. Like I tensed up, my boss walked in. But at the end of that is you're doing things that you're embarrassed about. And said, why did I say that? Why did I do? I'm thinking of a circumstance right now where I carried the flag into a meeting to do something. And today I look at it and said, oh, my gosh, I'm so embarrassed I did that. And and so Mm -hmm. that's where it ends. And that's where we start saying, you know what? I need to set some boundaries. I need to be okay with who I am. And I'd, I'd be curious to see if you have any thoughts or ideas on how to get to a place where you are okay with where you are and you don't need the approval of others. I have one that happened to me, but I'd be curious if you have any with you. But those triggers lead all the way up to a place where we literally betray ourselves. We don't act like Mm -hmm. ourselves. We're not congruent. We give our soul to somebody else so that they'll stay in relationship with us. Yeah. Um, I mean, if I sit here, there's probably a million tiny things. I just know that I was so tired of not being authentic. Like it was just so exhausting to conform when I knew like that was not who I was. Let let me ask you a question. I think you're more confident in who you are and what you believe, where you're going, the lifestyle you have. What's the biggest event where you crossed over there? Was it moving to Virginia? Was it leaving the ministry? Was it, uh, tell me, what's the biggest event that pushed you over that edge and got you to where you are? Definitely moving. I mean, if like the single most was definitely that. It's interesting. Um, Adrian and I are doing, we're doing like this little couples counseling app. It's called lasting. We're not sponsored. Um, but, um, so we were, they give you like prompts and every day we just like have a little discussion and we were talking about, um, you know, growing together. And so they wanted you just to quickly say like, what's one thing you see in your partner that's different than when you first met them. Um, and of course we've been together just three years, but he was like, Oh, confidence. And I was like, really? So wow. when I met him, I thought I was very confident. And he was like, oh, no, like, you're you're way more confident now. And I was like, wow, that's fascinating. Um, but, yeah, even, even that, like, from the time we met to now, which I would say, yeah, my confidence has grown, but I didn't – I hadn't seen it in myself as much as he had. And so, um, yeah, it definitely goes back to, to moving, to taking the big leap and – and changing my life completely. And so that that just helped immensely. Well, that's really interesting to me. I, go ahead, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Well, and I was just going to say, and I think to um, the job that I have now, um, my, my former boss um, at the job I have now, um, she just left, but she didn't give a rip what anyone thought. <laughs> Like in, internally, um, and if you're listening, hey girl. Um, but she was just like somebody who's like, I'm gonna do what is what I think is best, and if you don't like it, I'm sorry. And I was like, dang, okay. Um, and sometimes that would really piss some people off. Oh my mm. gosh! But she was just very confident in, especially the work side of stuff. Like she was like, no, I know my stuff this is what we're doing. And I was like, okay. And so I think even being around someone like that has also helped me career wise to be like, no, this is the decision. I am equipped. I am confident. I have done the work. I have sat down and made the pros and cons. This is it. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry. 
And I know, and I listen, I'm the most collaborative person that you'll ever work with. Um, but then there's sometimes the leader has to make the decision. So that's been something that I've learned, but yeah, being around some people who are just like, this is who I am. And I think you did, you've been a great example of that. And you know what? I'll tell, let me tell you while we're here. Let me, let me just have a minute. Let, let me get have... this mic test, test one, two. Come let on, me girl. tell you who's always been, well, let me tell you who's always been that for me as well. What? And that is your wife. Really? Your wife. Tina, Tina Davis Honorkamp. Let me tell you, I have been so impressed because from the moment I met her, she's like, I'm not like a pastor's wife. I'm not what y'all think. I am my own person. I like my own things. This is how I like to dress. This is what I like to do for fun. This is how I like to speak my mind. And I was like, cause I've been grown up. I grew up in a denomination where like every pastor's wife was copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Copy. It's true. And I met Tina and I was like, dad gum. Yes, ma'am. You like what you like. You do what you want to do. You dress how you want to dress. You cut your hair. I remember when she would like had that short little pixie cut. She's like, yeah, what's up? And I was like, oh my gosh, this woman, she knows who she is and she's not here to fit somebody's mold. So shout out Tina. I just got to give her a props because she's honestly always been so impressive. For, for and I can reason. honestly echo that and say, I remember the first time someone came up and said, hey, you're the pastor's wife. We need you to make the brownies. She said, I don't bake brownies. And they didn't know what to say to her. She's like, I just don't make, I'm not baking brownies. I'm not coming to that thing. I don't come to that meeting. Yeah. And, and just. No, that was just, that's not her. She'll do what she wants to do. She ain't going to do what she doesn't want to mm -hmm. do. And, and you know, and that probably, some of that came out of probably understanding her strengths, but some of that came out mm -hmm. of trauma. Even trauma mm -hmm. in your life mm -hmm. can help you get prepared for that. Um, going back to what you yeah. said a few minutes ago, um, you know, like I said, there's very few people I know that can say, I'm not going to conform to that image. I'm altogether different. I'm me. That doesn't fit on me. Get that off of me. But, you know, just thinking about um, walking through some of those things, you said that moving was the biggest thing. I would think job changes, uh, mm -hmm. relational changes, whether that's spouse, whether that's boyfriend, girlfriend, close friends. Um, but, but moving away from where you are, you get to start over. You could cre recreate yourself every decade if you wanted to by just moving away. Mm -hmm. And so those are some very key things to think about. How do I break out of this mold that I'm in right now? I would say the number one conformity issue we have is our family. Because we have mm -hmm. we have tradition and history with them. And it's like, well, she's always been that way. She was that way when she was seven. Well, she's 37. She ain't like that anymore. She don't do that stuff, but you can't see it because you're stuck 30 years ago. But I would think that most places, you know, you could, if someone's sitting there today and said, how do I break out of where I am? Quit your job. Try a new job. Move somewhere else. 30 minutes away. Mm -hmm. uh, stop conforming to a friend that's sucking your soul out of you. And see what happens. Because mm -hmm. you know what? You don't have to do something major. You just got to do something this big. And they will run for the hills. Oh, right, yeah. Emily? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Trust me, it doesn't take much. It doesn't take much. Um, yeah, there was... Um, oh, how, how delicately do I Careful. say this? Now I know. Now that I'm like, oh gosh, we've had five thousand people plus. Actually, probably closer to six thousand because I don't count the YouTube stuff um, in our analytics. Uh, listen to this. So I'm like, hi, who's out there? Um, but when I moved, there was just so much freedom, and when I left ministry, there was so much freedom because there was not this expectation that I had to go to coffee with every single person who asked me. And don't get me wrong. If you're listening to this nine times out of 10, I love spending, I love people and I've loved my interactions yeah. with people. But then there were some people who we would, you know, we would do these like coffee or lunch things and they would just like, complain. It wasn't, I listen, I understood I was in a pastoral role. So, you know, I was there to listen and give guidance and, like I said, nine times out of 10, it was very beautiful. And I, I had the grace to do that. And so I was happy to listen and, and give some guidance where I could, but there would be some people who they used me just 
to like word vomit and they didn't want to change. They didn't want yeah. help. They just needed someone to throw up on yeah. and it was torture. It was torture. And so as soon as I was released from that, then I also got to release that expectation because before, if I would have said, no, I don't want to meet with you. I don't feel like this is healthy. I don't feel like, you know, you're growing from our conversations or anything I say, you're not really applying it. Like, oh my gosh, it would have been drama. There have been, yeah. you know, multiple people brought into it. And it was just like, I didn't even have the option to do that. And so unfortunately our circumstances sometimes like, especially in ministry roles, like can hinder that unless there yeah. is a culture of support that allows you to be like, no, this isn't working anymore. So we're going to make sure that that you have a voice to say yes and no to what's healthy. Um, and I'll just be honest, most church settings don't have that or allow for that, which is painful. But I, I would also point to the other side of the argument that there are most people don't have healthy relationships to help unpack their stuff. So they borrow right. from a minister relationally what they should have in their private life. Recently, I mm. saw someone I haven't seen in two years, and I said, how are you doing? And 20 minutes later, it was nothing but a one-side diatribe, what you called a word vomit. And, and it's like, but that's what they're used to with ministry is I need yeah. somebody that I can that I can just like borrow their ears, their heart, their empathy for a while. And so we as ministers get used to that. that that's a role we play. And I don't play that role anymore. But that person didn't see the disconnect. And so they're like, oh, yeah, here's somebody I can just vomit on. And they get used to it. And as ministers, we have to be very careful that we're open to everybody, which just mm -hmm. in incredibly makes us susceptible to people pleasing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's, there's not healthy culture in America that, I mean, I've not, well, I'll say I've not seen it done. Well, maybe it exists, okay. maybe it's out there. Sure. I just have sure. never seen. Um, and I think, I think you, there were some times when you advocated for it because you had really good boundaries. Um, or at least I'd, towards the I'd end. Decent like I decent boundaries, watching. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, comparative um, to some, you had better, a lot better boundaries than what I had seen. But um, it was, yeah, I just don't think there's a lot of um, places where people can be taken care of on, on the other side where, you know, again, I believe, you know, when you're called into ministry, you're given a grace yeah. for that. And um, so that's why a lot of it, you know, it was totally fine, but then there was times, man, it, it was just like, this is not what I was supposed to be doing. Like, this is not it. And there was never, there was never an opportunity or I never felt like there was for me to say, can someone help me navigate this? Yeah. Or am I allowed to say no? no. Am I really, really allowed to say no? <laughs> and, and Henry Cloud because says, I felt if like you I was trapped. Yeah. Henry Cloud says, if you can't say no, your yes means nothing. If you don't have the right to say no, then your yes is not complicity at all. And one of the things that one of the sayings that you and I know in ministry is you're only as good as your last sermon. So, you know, if you're preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you know, you might hit it out of the uh, ballpark on a Sunday morning, but next Sunday's coming. And that performance mentality is driving you. Mm -hmm. And I do want to mention this because about five, seven years ago, I spent some uh, intense time in prayer and I felt God's joy with me, his pleasure with me. And mm -hmm. when I tasted that, I began to lose any interest in other people's pleasure with me. And I wish everybody could find that. I wish every human being mm -hmm. can understand that they were made in the image and likeness of God. And that when God looks at them, he sees this unique, beautiful creation that no one has ever been created like before. The world has never seen someone like you before. And that individual gift is really our value. So when we act yeah. like other people, we lose our value. 
And I just wish mm-hmm. everybody could experience the joy of celebrating their uniqueness, their gift to the world, their perspective of the world. I was talking to somebody the other day that you know well. They've been in ministry 30, 40 years, and they were thinking about writing a book about a subject. And they said, you know, so many other people have written a book about this subject. How arrogant for me to write a book about this subject. And then an old timer said to them, the world has never seen this subject through your eyes. You have something to say that's never been said before. And at me, just having written a book on forgiveness and knowing that R.T. Kendall has written Total Forgiveness, the, you know, the best book on the subject, I agree with that. You know, I have a unique perspective. And I just wish more people understood that they'll find more value for themselves and just being uniquely themselves and not worrying about anybody else. And I've said this in, in, a thousand times, and when you've heard me say this, you can't be fully loved until you're fully known. Mm-hmm. And the problem is you can either give us your original copy or a persona of yourself. The problem with persona is even the people that love the persona, it doesn't feel good to you because you're not that. And so we have to choose to not be the persona to get acceptance and be ourselves mm-hmm. and actually feel it. And the love that comes through from it that causes us to have the confidence to keep being more unique than we've ever been before. I love that. I love that. And I think that little snippet, I wish more people could really grasp because it is very shallow feeling when people fall in love with the persona. Right. Or the the variation of you that they've they've encountered yeah. and it just it's never fulfilling it's just never fulfilling and so to be you fully yourself and to let people in is beautiful and that you know there's the friends that have seen me at my very worst and love me no matter what like those are my closest friends i have yeah. let them see the yeah yucky, icky, falling apart, crying on the floor, cussing up a storm, like, you know, (laughs) just hello, this is all of me. Because as much as I would love to be all the time, like this perfect little polished thing, that's not fully who I am. Like I, we all have an inner self that has trauma and has junk and has mess and unresolved issues and whatever else is in there that on our life's journey, we get to unpack. Um, so until someone is just, you've really shown that it is hard to accept then the real love And, um, you know, I was even talking, I I talk about my coworkers, my two coworkers all the time on this podcast. Um, but it has just been, we should bring them on one day. Oh, they would, they would love it. Um, well, one of them would love it. The other one's more introverted and be like, uh, I don't know about that, but they have just, we've created a space in our work environment where whatever you're, wherever you're at emotionally, mentally, whatever that day you have you have safety and freedom to be in that. And if wow. you're having an off day, guess what? We love you and we're going to yep. give you your space or we're going to surround you. However, yep. whatever you need, however you need it, we're going to do that for you. And it's just been so liberating to as their leader for them to do that for me too. And that I can yep. walk in there and, you know, still get respect as a leader, still be followed, blah, 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 and still lead the team. But also, they know I'm a human and I'm not on this pedestal and they've seen the dark and the ugly and the anxiety and all this stuff, but they also have seen the brilliance and, you know, the creativity and all that stuff. And so just to be fully seen and fully known and then fully loved, like it's, it's such, it's so beautiful. And especially to find that as an adult, like I was so scared to move because I was like, oh my gosh, friends I am I am a friends girl. I love yep. people. I love being having friends. So to be able to have the relationships I hear have here in Virginia Beach from moving is so awesome because I I didn't think I would be able to find that. And I have. But it's because I've been like, here it is. Here's the mess. If it's too much for you, well, <laughs> I'm too much for you. Yeah. 
Well, I appreciate that conversation, but also I want to say that when we think about being fully loved and fully known, if you're a people pleaser, you're constantly adjusting. You're never going to feel mm-hmm. loved. You're, you're adjusting to someone else's personality or persona. And therefore, you're never going to feel loved. And I think every person deserves to be loved for who they are. And finding your unique self has to happen for that to happen. And so Mm -hmm. as we talk about moving out of people pleasing, set a boundary. Just set one boundary and, and you'll be shocked at how quick some people will leave, some people will stay. But having people that can love you in your worst moment is one of the most beautiful things mm-hmm. in the world. And I want every one of you to have that because there are people out there that will appreciate who you are, even as you're becoming who you want to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing more beautiful that when you are being your full self, whether that's like in a goofy way or you're really like having an anxious moment and you're just like, yeah, in it. And somebody still looks at you and they're like, hey, I still love you. I still respect you. And you know what? I think I even like you more because you've (laughs) let me see that you're You're a human being. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, and again, I know we're wrapping up, but I know Nick, when you got up publicly and talked about depression and your own journey with depression, this was years ago. I, I had never seen a pastor do that up until that point. I had never really seen a leader in a community, especially just be like, Hey, Like I'm a human being and here's all these dark parts that I'm struggling with. And I was like, wow. So again, the more authentic we are, it liberates other people. And it also shows us who our people are, you know, who's really in our corner. Cause you don't want fake people in your corner. You want the real people who are going to stand by you. Um, and so just continue to be your authentic self. It's scary. It is so scary to be your real weirdo self, but we all are, we all have our quirks and like things that we struggle with. But once you're really your authentic self, your people will find you. I believe your job will find you, um, your community environment, whatever that is church. Um, and it's just so, it's so liberating to be Mm -hmm. on this side. And let let me tell you, I still got a long way to go. I'm still, this is not something I'm like, I've overcome people pleasing, but I have drastically climbed up the mountain thus far. So to respond to what you just said about me, um, after those conversations, somebody came up to me and said, I don't want a pastor that's 10 miles ahead of us that can tell us how to get there. I want a pastor who's with us experiencing what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. It can tell us what they're feeling and why they made the choices that they made. Recently, I was with somebody and that was mentoring me in an area. And I said, tell me the biggest mistakes you've ever made. And they said to me, I'll tell you on one condition. You never create the same mistakes I created and you learn from them. That's the only way I can redeem my mistakes is by you learning from them. Mm-hmm. And I thought that them sharing their mistakes was more important than them sharing all their successes, their best practices, all the other stuff. I think the world is looking for authenticity, especially your generation. Authenticity. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me how you got to the top by best practices. Tell me what it cost you. Tell me what your soul mm-hmm. felt like. Tell me, you know, the journey, what it did to you emotionally. And so I, I think those are definitely conversations that need to be had along the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, good chat, Nick. I think this is good. Um, I just appreciate your vulnerability and authenticity um, because obviously we wouldn't be able to have these conversations if we weren't willing to go there um, and put ourselves out there. Because I'm sure um, anytime you do anything public, we're letting people vote (laughs) on like what, you know, will I keep, keep listening? Will I keep engaging? And so for those of you who are, Thank you. I've, I had a very, very sweet message this week from somebody who listens, and I just really appreciate that. Thank you guys for allowing us to have this space and um, have these conversations. So 
We're gonna wrap things up. We thank you for joining us. We wanna shout out real quick to this incredible music you're hearing by Caleb Honorkamp um, from our promotional photography that's done by Before the Foundations Photography, AKA Allison Frost. And to our producer who helped us troubleshoot right before <laughs> this episode started, <laughs> Adrian Vosch. Um, please like, follow, subscribe. Um, all of that can be found below or in the episode notes and we look forward to seeing you guys on the next one thanks so much bye bye